Welcome to the Crypto Teacher. And guys, you know I come back with that video just to make you think. Now, when it comes to the lending facilities, guys, we know how important it is. The lending facilities that the Treasury is going to be shutting down, they cannot resume. And guys, we know there's always a strategic reason for that. The Volcker rule was changed also, guys. Don't forget that. What they're doing is that they're removing all of the safety nets. So remember that 30, 40 billion that banks had to keep just in case something happens? They no longer have to. Now these lending facilities where they've already pumped all this money as far as buying corporate bonds, they've already done it all. Now they don't have to. So now when we run into this financial crisis again, and we know we're going to run into it soon, there is no safety net. Now, on my crypto stock channel, I went over that banks are allowed to do buybacks. That's right, guys. The banks are allowed to do buybacks. We know Europe also suspended buybacks and dividends. Next year, they're going to start back up. And guys, it's like a domino effect. They're going to bring the whole house down. Because we know what the New World Order does. Cause a problem. Wait for the reaction. And they're going to run in with the solution. And guys, what is that solution? Universal basic income and cryptos and blockchain, guys. At a debate over its emergency lending programs held up the entire $900 billion stimulus package. And joining us now to walk through exactly what happened and why it's important is Kate Judge. She's a law professor at Columbia who's an expert on the legal matters surrounding the central bank. Uh, how are you? Doing well, thank you. So I want to kick things off by uh, just talking about the compromise that was made. It effectively bars the Fed, again, the central bank, from reopening three specific emergency programs that they had opened up in the midst of the crisis, one to help state and local governments, one for small and medium-sized businesses, in addition to one that backstops the corporate bond market. A lot of inside-the-weed stuff here, but what's the consequences of the Fed not being able to have those tools in the future if this package doesn't pass today? It's a great question, and it depends how far in the future you look. Uh, one of the, the near-term consequences is it means that when we have the change in transition and the new administration comes in, they are not going to be able to use those facilities that have been set up and are currently operational to, to potentially provide even more of a boost to the economic recovery that's still fragile and underway. And, and particularly when it comes to Main Street and municipalities, there's a lot of reason to expect that the, the change of administration might have resulted in perhaps more generous terms and more support. Longer term, when the next economic shock hits or the next financial crisis hits, it's going to mean that the, the Fed is still able to provide support to banks and even to non-bank financial intermediaries. But it's not going to replicate what it did this time around, where it provided support directly to the real economy. You know, that's a great question, and I think it's going to take us a little while to fully parse it out. So one of the, the many reasons that some were concerned about the Fed stepping in is it was clear that they were much better positioned to provide support for the largest companies than to provide support for Main Street. As soon as they announced the, the two different corporate credit facilities, we saw a real meaningful decline in spreads, and the largest companies have been issuing a, a record amount of debt. Uh, basically ever since that announcement at, at very reasonable rates. By contrast, for the, the mid-sized companies that they sought to help through the Main Street facility, they really needed to work with banks, and that was completely new territory. So it took a lot longer to get off the ground. Want to take up. Uh, another way of asking is, is, is this whole semantic issue going to crop up again six months from now? You know, uh, it's a good point. There, there was a lot of concern early on because the original draft, what, what it got leaked, it was similar to. And a lot of lawyers, myself included, uh, were concerned that that was overly broad and that was ambiguous. And, and so there was a possibility of it precluding uh, potential programs or facilities that could be quite useful. Um, as you pointed out, the language has gotten narrow, but but how effective that narrowing is going to be in terms of really freeing the Fed up to do what it most wants to do uh, depends on how aggressive the Fed lawyers want to be. And I think there, there could be very real concerns 
that anything that looks too much like these facilities, like you said, anything that's backing corporate credit, for example, and really buying up bonds, uh, might be territory that the Fed is going to be very hesitant uh, to enter into without further authorization by Congress. Republican Mitt Romney of Utah, also a former Republican presidential nominee. Senator Romney, uh, it's good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to get to that relief bill in just one second. But first, I have to ask you, President Trump held a meeting on Friday in which he reportedly discussed with his disgraced former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, this deranged idea to declare martial law to force new elections in states that Biden won. They also have discussed appointing conspiracy theorist Sidney Powell as a special counsel to investigate her baseless claims of election fraud, and also issuing an executive order to seize voting machines. This is, needless to say, quite alarming and scary to a lot of people. What's your response? What will Senate Republicans do to make sure none of this madness happens? Well, it's not going to happen. Uh, that's going nowhere. And I understand the president is casting about trying to find some way to have a different result than the one that was delivered by the American people. But it's really sad in a lot of respects and embarrassing because the president could right now be writing the last chapter of this administration with a victory lap with regards to the, the vaccine. After all, he pushed aggressively to get the vaccine developed and distributed. That's happening on a quick time frame. Uh, he could be going out uh, championing this extraordinary success. And instead, uh, he's leaving Washington uh, with a, a whole series of conspiracy theories and things that are so nutty and loopy uh, that people are shaking their head, wondering what in the world has gotten into this man. And I, I think that's unfortunate because he has more accomplishments uh, than this, uh, this last chapter. And guys, I advise you that Trump was going to leave out what the perception that NWO is pushing, that he's leaving out fighting for the people. His stance on the election has not changed, guys. He's constantly, as stated, he's won. All of his followers, if you go on Twitter, everywhere, he keeps saying that he won the presidency. So, guys, you have to understand this is the message that they're pushing. We know when it comes to Twitter, Stephen Miller runs that account, not Trump. But the fact is that people don't understand that because they are what? They are asleep. Trump warned that China would take over America. Guys, haven't I already proved that thousands of times? Yes, I have. I told you to save that quote, guys. Because the fact is, we're going to see China rise. Remember, we're going into the fourth industrial revolution and China is 10 years ahead of America. Remember, guys, when it comes to the new world order, everything is planned out.